This is Talking Stations, a show about EVE Online. I am your host, Artemis Albosa. Joining me today, we have some old favorites, Arcia. Hey, how are you doing? We've also got Nick Bison, who's engineering for us today. And uh, we've also got Khan joining us yet again. Hello, how are you doing? Our special guest on today's show, we're actually going to flip the script a little bit because he's taking some time out of some very serious and sweaty competitive gaming to join us. Baltram from an alliance whose name I am not going to pronounce on air. Hello, I'm Baltram. It's the Hidden Leaf Village Ninja Assassin Squad esports team. <laughs> now you may hear that name and think that uh, they're not particularly serious about this game known as EVE Online, but you may recognize it from a recent battle report and some kill mails that have been hitting basically everywhere news is posted recently. That is because what occurred is some faction titans. That's right, pirate faction titans, what are might be the most expensive non-exclusive like alliance tournament ships in the game. Two of them died at once. And Baltrum, what tell us the story. Like how how did this happen? Well, so, Amar reinforced one of our Atanors, right? And, uh, we decided at first to just uh, try out some weird Raven comp that we came up with, and we thought, like, hey, this is going to be really fun if we use this, but it didn't work out at all. So, we lost a couple Ravens and burned back as fast as we could to our staging and grabbed Macarials and went back into the fight, right? Sadly, we don't have a lot of people, right, in our group. Like, we're pretty small, and everybody actually outnumbers us, so that's a bit of a yike. So we came in back with the Macarials, dropped, like, I think, two high anglers as well to help us with the DPS. Even with the high angle dreads, the Amar fleet was still tanking us, no big deal. What and were they flying? They were flying Navpox, actually. Like, post-laser Navpox approaching us, going at, like, full conflict range and just blasting, right? Right on. Like a couple seconds after we go in, actually, it didn't take too long. They immediately dread bomb in on us, and uh, we draw dread bomb in on them. And then we decided to, you know, just have a bit of fun and drop a couple wyverns as well, you know, because we had some wyverns prepared and we thought, like, that's going to be epic, you know, what's the worst that can happen? We feed a couple wyver wyverns, actually, no big deal, right? But. There is a legendary pilot, Alana Klo, who decided to jump two faction titans in as well, right? I was actually not aware of that. I thought it's just two normal titans. I was like, mm, you know, we're chilling. Dog Workers comes in and blobs the fuck out of the, the fight as well, right? Like, I don't know, like, local just keeps piling, piling, and piling, and piling. I see, like, oh, local is at, like, 160 people. And I look at TeamSpeak, and there's, like, 15 of us on comms. And I'm like, hmm, this is a curious situation we found ourselves in, you know? So for the next like 30 minutes or so, uh, when I realized that this is faction titans that we're, that we're having tackled here, at least ours are tackled, right? Uh, it turned into a struggle of trying to free them. We managed to free one of them once, but sadly he warped to the sun and got tackled again, where we nearly freed him another time, like a second time actually, using How? Max ECM Widows. I was about to ask, how did you manage to free them if you've got like hundreds of players whose sole purpose is to keep these things held down and kill them? How do you get them out? Well, we have obviously Balgorns with Newts. We newt out the Hicks, right? We have uh, some ECM on our Macarial, so we try to help there as well by ECMing the enemy Hicks, even though they usually have pretty high sensor strength and whatnot. Um, but the big meme is like ECM Widows, right? Like you jump them in. Widows have the, I don't know, I might be wrong. But I think Widows have the strongest ECM in the game, right? So those are like our bailout mobiles to try and get out expensive ships. And he warped out once, but sadly not a second time. At RNG, what can you do? <laughs> oh man, that's great. I, I'm very curious. The Titan fleets, super capital fleets, typically players who want to fly those ships will join one of the big groups because the groups have the infrastructure to build them. The groups have the 
fleets and support around them to let you fly them in like a super capital umbrella or something like that. But here you are with your 15 dudes dropping them in low sec. What's give us the context? What's your group do? How does this occur? Um, I mean, at the moment, for the last like three months or so, we've been mostly unsubbed, right? Um, to be honest, um, nobody really enjoyed low sec much anymore. We're like very dedicated low sec pirates, and nobody wants to go to no sec. But low sec is in a pretty weird spot where everybody, like, there's either nobody or everybody that's there is blue to each other. So it's pretty hard being independent. But we love multi boxing threads. And when you do that a lot, then somehow people start acquiring supers. And people also have a lot of super alts. And they just, you know, at the end of the day, people want to use these ships, at least in, in our group. Um, I think the general idea of acquiring cool spaceships is to use them, even though we're a very small group. And usually we get away with it. But since yesterday was a bit of a freestyle, you know, like I personally didn't plan at all for any faction titans to land on grid. Um, yeah, it went a bit upside down, you know. <laughs> we dropped Titans before into combat against dog workers. Like, I mean, I think that was when Predator Elite was still playing. We actually just fucking, like, he started dropping supers on us, and we were like, fuck it, okay, if you drop supers on us, we're just gonna, like, all get Titan alts now, or, like, sub our Titan alts, and just fucking brawl it out with Titans. Fuck it, dude, you know? <laughs> so we did that and pooned them. But uh, ever since then, it's been probably, like, over a year or something since that was a thing, and then there was no really interesting fights anymore. So, so what brought you back? You said you guys were pretty disengaged. What what brought you back to Eve Online? The Alliance tournament, to be honest. Like the Alliance tournament was announced, and you kind of have to sub to play in it, you know. Um, so we had to sub, and nobody of us enjoyed PvP in low sec at all anymore, right? Like, I mean, you can just roam small gang every day, and do whatever, low effort memes. But we're really into like, how should I explain it? Like, um, sort of like. 15 v 15 or like 15 v, v 20 30 fights with caps and shit you know like where you fight like slightly outnumbered or like just even fights where nobody dies and you have to do a lot of switching and tactical thinking you know and none of these fights were happening for like over a year so we all kind of ended up unsubbing and then ccp is like hey lions tournament is coming back so we're resubbing we're playing the at practices and then we realized well in the practices like wow if PvP is actually really fun, I completely forgot that. Let's uh, log into TQ and do some PvP there, boys. Let's go. That's awesome. Yeah, did you did you guys play in the feeder rounds, or did you buy your way straight into the straight into the tournament? Uh, we tried to buy our way straight into the tournament, but we were actually one of the three teams that bet like the. There was sort of like uh, three people that didn't make the like. I don't know how should I put it. There was two slots open or something, right? And uh, three teams bid the same amount. We were one of those teams, and we put our submission in the last. So we put were put into the feeders, but we slapped our way through the feeders, so we're now in the actual AT in November. Awesome. Well, um, you can't fly Faction Titans in the feeders, or sorry, in the Alliance tournament, but that also means you can't lose them, I suppose. So it'll well, be uh, definitely interesting to watch. I'm more of a frigate pilot myself anyways, you know? I've fed an imp before, and I'll do it again. Sometimes I even stream that stuff, you know, like just roaming in the imp, if I can be asked. So, I don't know. I'm more of a subcap guy myself, to be honest. Fair enough. Definitely an interesting event that um, it's wonderful to look at and talk about and think about just how this happens. It's not a common occurrence in EVE Online anymore. Yeah, I think everybody thinks there was like some big plan. Like, I mean, maybe maybe the enemy side had some big plans or something, right? I mean, obviously they had some plans because they bad found left, right, top and center. So there was definitely some planning going on. On our end, it was more like just, hey, let's go and feed some dreads for the sake of content. And then, you know, suddenly there's like faction titans on grid. And I'm like, oh shit, you know, this is curious. Yeah. No, no, they were all preformed, right? Like, I mean, all the people that came, right? They were already there just to blob the fuck out of us because engaging us in a one-to-one -one ratio is pretty spooky, right? For most people, like, I'm, I mean, this is kind of like a, I don't know, weird brag, I guess. But 
I'm pretty sure that none of these groups would engage as one to one ratio, right? So obviously they were preformed because they jumped in immediately with the entire blob the moment, you know, the trap was sprung or whatever they were trying to trap because I don't know what they were planning, but we were planning nothing, right? Like Alana just decided to jump into faction titans and fucking go for it and big respect to him, you know? I was pretty, I mean, you have to respect it, to be honest. Let's face it. You're right on. Exactly. Like, he just wants to use his ships, and, you know, what can you do? It's epic. I guess everybody else had a really great time. To be honest, we had a great time as well. Like, I mean, there's probably some people thinking that we are, like, really evil now or some shit, but we're actually chilling. I don't know. Yeah, right on. Nick, I think you're muted, but to just repeat what you were mentioning, some of the folks in the in the Twitch chat are talking about how it's really cool to, to just be willing to drop your, your spaceships in fleet. Like, if they die, they die. That's what they're there for. It's all pixels at the end of the day. I mean, it's not like I'm happy about us losing two faction titans, right? But at the end of the day, it is what it is. What can you do, you know? Like, let's keep going. Who cares? All right, fair enough. Well, um, anybody else have any final thoughts on this one? Oh, I think we saw a question. What's this? What's the deal with the imp? You said you fed an imp in the past. How did? What's the story there? Um, uh, I got an imp gifted to me, and I roamed that for like I don't know the better part of a year or two years. I actually don't know. And I streamed most of it on Twitch as well, live. And at some point. Um, one hole baited and got me that I was at like 276 kill marks or something, which Ooh. I think personally is actually quite impressive for solo roaming it unscouted, no links out, nothing St streaming it live on Twitch. I think I had a pretty good run, but eventually he got me and uh, yeah, big respect to him. He's the best at what he does and I'm dead. But luckily I have the best corp in the game and they just crowdfunded me a new imp. <laughs> Oh man, for those unfamiliar, the Imp is a, an Alliance Tournament prize ship, so very valuable due to its rarity, but it's also particularly powerful because it's a Sancha's Nation pirate faction. So it's got huge bonuses to its afterburner, and it's a, an interceptor to boot. So you've got the interdiction nullification, which was passive back when you were flying at Daltrum. And yeah, then yeah, yeah. zooming around on your AB, you can't be scrams. Crazy DPS on that thing too, right? How much were you pushing? I don't know, I think if you like, go, go close range ammo, you can go up to like 600 heated or something. 600 DPS, something like that. If you really want to push the close range DPS, I guess. Awesome. I think, I think the only thing that could have made this story better is if the, the faction titans had been tackled by the big brother to the imp, which name the escapes fiend. me. The fiend, yeah. yeah. Which is the hick version of the alliance tournament ship. But I have a new imp, right, that I stream sometimes, live PvP. And uh, I really want to have a fiend as well. And then I actually want to, on stream, live, catch a super with my fiend. I think that would be epic. That would be awesome, yeah. All right, well, Baltrum, thank you very much for coming on, sharing us your side of the story. We'll let you get back to your um, sweaty CSGO play, <laughs> as I understand it. Yeah, yeah it's okay. It's uh, some CSGO, like, I don't know. I don't want to play EVE right now. Fair enough. <laughs> Alright, so in other news, interesting things that happened today, we'll go back to our normal programming of just a recap of what we discussed earlier this week. Specifically, we had our shows, of course, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. On Tuesday, we had Ren, a member of the TIS staff, coming in and giving us a lot of great details on Moongoo. He was joined by Abby Rova, another member of our staff, and I believe it was Ren gave us the info on Moon Goo and Boosters, and then Abby gave us the info on Tech 3. So basically everything reactions related, you can go and check that out there, as well as some other player news that was happening around Monday, Tuesday. Oh, Ren's in the chat. Nice to see ya. Then on Wednesday, we had an awesome story that actually occurred on Tuesday. We just didn't go in-depth on it. There were a battle of Zernitras, so these are, again, pirate faction capitals, but this time Dreadnoughts. They're Triglavian Dreadnoughts, and they're rather expensive, 
They're also rather powerful, and you don't see them very often. But they, two of them, were dropped in a wormhole, fighting each other. There's a fantastic video of it that we have shared with you all, and we'll probably post a link for it in the chat. So I definitely recommend going and checking that out to hear more about what the deal is with Cernitras and fighting in wormhole space. Really cool stuff. And then a bit of an oddball on Thursday. I say oddball. It was just another unique circumstance. Rundle brought his wife on, if I understand correctly, to um, to chat about what it's like being married to an Eve addict, colloquially known as an Eve widow. They were just chatting about what that's like. And it's a uh, really cool vibes. Plus, we also had some guests on from Pi and Lumen, which are corporations I'm not particularly familiar with, but I was understand that they have some ties to faction warfare and role play. Lumen Help me out, guys. One of the largest uh, Amar loyal alliances is a few years old at this point. It was formed right before the Tobacco War. Pi is one of, if not the oldest active corporation in the game. It was like the third corporation created after EVE Online launched. And it's a really old school Amar roleplay group that only flies Amar ships. Um, and for the long time was in Faction War. And the Pi Inc. Corporation uh, joined Lumen, which was kind of out of the blue for a lot of the RPers. Is it weird because their RP doesn't mix or is it just... No, their, their RP mixes. It's just that they... They were always allied, um, but they had like very different styles about how they went about things like diplomacy and and such. Like Lumen worked a lot with the other empires during the Triglavian War. Pi didn't really outside of like Amar space, for example. And, and, sorry. Another interesting thing about Lumen and Pi is Pi, I don't know if they still do this today, but Pi is like strict with who they allow in their corporation. I think you have to be an Amarian only. And yeah. I think Lumen's a little bit more relaxed with the recruiting. Yeah, Lumen doesn't have any racial restrictions, um, at least at the Alliance level. Uh, Pi does have the, the racial restriction and the ship restriction. Um, so Pi members can't fly non-Amar ships. They can't use pirate implants. They uh, have to be of one of the three Amar bloodlines. Wow. And... Pi was also like the the corp that founded CVA back in the day. Um, if you're familiar with that, after after Project Deliverance was over in Providence, they moved to Faction War when that came out, and they split with CVA and they were in Faction War up until just recently when they dropped it to Joint Lumen. Project. Oh. Yes. Mm -hmm. Project Deliverance, that is an interesting name. What is that? I've, I've never oh, heard that of was it. the initial uh, operation to reclaim Providence by the Amaro players back in the day. Um, the description of the Providence region has flavor text about how the Amar Empire always had its sights set on taking over Providence. Um, so, like before faction warfare was a thing, that's what the Amar RPers did. They went and took over Providence. And. CVA obviously stood there for a long time until Wrecking Crew kicked them out. But uh, Pi was the founding corporation of CVA. Like, we look at CVA and the Alliance, you'll see founding corporation, Pi Inc. Um, and uh, uh, Operation Deliverance was the first reclaiming of Providence. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, that was when uh, AAA and UK had went in to uh, remove them originally, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. UK always used to go into Providence and uh, and fight with them there and t t take over some of the systems and stuff. And AAA was like so just south of Providence and always give them a hard time back then. That's that's accurate. I still have stuff in Pigsty, as funny as that is. Is Pigsty still around? I think that was like their uh, main staging in G-5 for a while. Not sure. Um, like... They were kicked out of Providence with Wrecking Crew. I don't know to which degree structures were given up or if they were just all destroyed. Yeah. 
another bit of interesting RP, and then I'll like get off of it. I uh, I believe uh, a year ago, Pi was recognized by um, the new Empress uh, as far as their own military type of like. Um, they they yeah. have their own private. Yeah, they talk about are <laughs> um, uh, an order of the uh, a chapter of the order of the Sacred Throne, the Sacred Throne yeah. order, and the high. Uh, commanders are recognized as paladin commanders of the sacred throne order and the regular members are paladin uh ordinaries of the sacred throne order it, it's basically a high honor given to them in a news article um them and C cba had a different one they were the paladin wardens of the providence marches um back before they got kicked out of providence yeah well just to, to answer the question if I understand correctly, the pigsty, you were referring to an old station that was built in GTAC 5, is that right? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, I, I looked it up, and as far as I can tell, that station would have been converted into a faction citadel when that took place, but no faction citadels have died in GTAC 5. So either it was successfully unanchored, or it's still standing. But, um... Oh. Yeah, everybody was surprised about Pyja and Lumen because of, like, the difference in, like... Diplomacy and stuff, the two organizations always used to go. Like, Lumen fought alongside us during the Pochfen War that just happened a, a few months ago um, with, like, most of the other world players from the Four Empires. And they fought with everybody in the Triglavian War, too, like I said. But Pi was always more insular, and, like, during the Triglavian stuff, they didn't really leave the Umar Empire and help the other empires too much. Hmm, for example well if you'd like to hear some more about what that transition is going to look like what they're looking forward to in the future you can definitely go on and check out thursday's show um, i'm glad you brought up the triglavians that's actually another topic that we wanted to discuss today there is apparently a player run event occurring on october 9th to the 16th so you've got some time to prep for it we'll hopefully be doing some more coverage as it nears but they're totality. putting on totality day what Help me out here. What does what's the significance of totality? So as we just had each of the four empires had a special holiday, all these holidays started as player created events. So the Triglavian role players are starting their holiday, um, which is like in the same kind of vein as the, the Empire's holidays, but for the Triglavians. Um, and they're doing it in October because uh, it's a month away from the Kaldari one kind of spaced out like the other ones. And so they're going to be putting on uh, a number of different events, like uh, a race around the, the Pachpin Circle, uh, a battle royale, battle royale where their fortas are in where Shota used to be, and propaganda contests and stuff with a lot of prizes. Uh, basically, to, to, in efforts of starting uh, an annual holiday, player graded or otherwise, uh, about the Triglavians that celebrates the weaving of Pachven back when that happened a year ago. Um, and like I said, all the holidays for all the empires started as player created stuff. So they're trying to go along the same path. Well, that's awesome. It's definitely something to keep an eye out for. I'll have to do some investigation and see if like this race around the circle if that, or the triangle, I guess. We should yeah, call the it. triangle. If, um, the loop. if that requires standings anymore, because there no, it doesn't change. require standings. Um, Triglavians might shoot you on a gate, and there's obviously going to be players shooting everybody because it's pot fun. Sweet. All right. Well, that's some interesting news that was taking place. Um, in other interesting news, we want to mention some stuff from CCP. So you may have noticed there was no downtime. Um, for a couple of days this week. I forget which day specifically. Can anyone jog my memory? Thursday and Friday. I forgot what today was. <laughs> and I, as I understand it, the no downtime had a few interesting side effects for the miners of the world. Con, you wanna... Oh, we'll get into that too. But Con, you want to walk us through what, what happened with this? What were some side effects? Yeah, so um, as a side effect of there being no downtime, the belts, or the asteroid belts specifically, uh, they didn't respawn. 
So you saw in certain systems that were already mined, those asteroids um, where they would normally respawn after downtime didn't do it that specific time. And um, a little bit of speculation that I kind of wanted to bring up on the show is if CCP does get to the point where they're able to no longer have downtimes, how will this affect, um, you know, the competitive nature between players and NPCs? Because NPCs are a very, um, how can I throw this out here? Are very competitive in certain systems. Whereas when you have the the, the regular factions like your Mimitar, your Galente, your Amarian uh, mining venture, or whatever you want to call them, but then as well you have your FOB mining fleets as well. Um, and I just kind of just was thinking how possibly with a limited amount of resources and belts, how will this uh, new phase of mining affect players who do depend on uh, the asteroid belts to make their money? Awesome. You're still muted. <laughs> well, what's it? Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, um, we kind of jumped the shark a bit and forgot to mention what downtime is for those unfamiliar. You probably know, but just in case, downtime is the daily occurrence where the servers shut down and restart. This is historically required for effective server maintenance. Um, but of course, with the recent surge in our Chinese and Australian time zone, it's a bit inconvenient for those players where it sort of just puts a break right in the middle of their gameplay. Uh, it used to be 15 minutes, sometimes longer, depending on the time. Recently, it's gotten down to around three to four minutes, and they're hoping to see if they can get rid of it entirely. Um, so it's a, it's a whole surprisingly big thing. They put out some fantastic cinematics about how interesting it was going to be and such a joy but let's let's talk some more about mining and the side effects that this had because i didn't expect it so it, um oh, go ahead i was gonna say it broke faction warfare the way a system flips in faction warfare is that you push the progress bar up to 100 percent um as the attacking side the system becomes a vulnerable and you can shoot the infrastructure hub and if you shoot the infrastructure hub and you get it down into hull, it flips and system transitions to lost and it flips to the other side's control at downtime. You can see where I'm going with this. <laughs> These I systems, actually forgot about Yeah, this. systems that were flipped uh, before the no downtime did not go over to the other side. Uh, the next the next day because there is no downtime to to reset um, and they just stayed in the state that they so were could in. They, could they be contested again, or were they just zombie systems that were stuck in this limbo? For for like the next day, uh, they were just on zombie systems. I think CCP was was aware and and fixed it, but I, I just remember hearing everybody in. Uh, the at least um the minmatar side saying uh they had they had flipped a couple systems and they just didn't didn't move <laughs> right. why that's important sorry i didn't mean to interrupt but why that's important is uh the minmatar is uh, coming back as far as trying to recontrol the war zone and to to push a system it requires a lot of um a lot of work you need to have 10 to upwards to 20 reships in certain days. Um, and then those days usually will go through all 20 of those ships, just constant fighting. So it's a lot of work. And for something like that to happen, there's possibly a reduce in morale when you like you push the system, you work really hard, and then you've got this random mechanic that basically uh, stops you from pushing a system because for, um, you know, Mimitar or any militia, you know, not only is the system important because it affects how much money that you make off of LP or your tier levels, but it also uh, stops the other faction from being able to docking in those uh, NPC stations in the system. So uh, I wonder if that 
uh, would affect the overall morale of the Mimitar or I if think it just that would was... affect the morale of the side that lost the system more because you can't start trying to take it back the next day. Um, That's true. Because when it's when it's at that lost state, you can't you can't push it back. You can't interact with this with the system at all. Basically, um, you have to wait till it flips, and then you can the other side can start pushing it. So the Minmatar in this case, uh, I don't know if the Amar also flipped the system the same day, but I know that the Minmatar flipped at least one, pushed it all the way up, and shot the iHub. And then it's locked into loss, and it can't move down. They can't; their progress can't be undone. So I don't think it's anything more of a <laughs> they forgot about faction warfare from the Minmatar side. Um, it might be annoying for the Amar side if they wanted to an- immediately start pushing the system back. I don't know if they did or not, but that would be the only case where it'd be annoying because normally you can just start working on it the next day. If they have like a, a siege planned for like starting the next day, we'll start sieging again. If it's if it's still lost, are you able to still dock? Well, so like after the um, loss, sorry if I'm kind of sidetracking it, because with evacs for people that weren't able to get things out of station, did they have an extra day to get their stuff out of those stations? You're right about that. You're right about that. I would still be the other side, the Mars side, being able to dock. Yeah, so they they had a lot of the people who didn't realize that they may have had like staging stuff had an extra day to also get their stuff out too. So that's another weird mechanic or outcome of that. I think it just it goes to show how complex it is and how difficult it is to remove this sort of thing, which has been there since the start of Eve. Like we are for years players have asked for downtime to be removed. And it's taken years to solve all of the technical challenges. And clearly we've still got some ways to go. I think in addition to sort of the the player and mechanic side of things where unexpected events occurred, we also had CCP looking into a bit of a technical side of things where they're, and I'm going to be honest, I don't understand what they're talking about. There's apparently some events that happen uh, that reset every day at downtime, but when downtime didn't occur, they just sort of kept piling up and piling up and piling up. CCP Explorer tweeted about it, and you could probably ask him if you're more into the technical side of things, but it seems like that's also another hurdle and a challenge that they're going to have to resolve before we can finally put the nail in the coffin for downtime. And a little bit of what Nick was uh, trying to say too, uh, we were doing a little bit of tinfoiling with um, if CCP did get to the point where they fully removed um, uh, the server reset, how um, would we possibly start to see NPCs going to moon mining uh, uh, belts and attempting to kind of like mine there or if they would re-add the coding and uh, to to allow them to be able to go to like low sec systems and mine those moons and in high sec, um, and how would players be able to also kind of be able to adapt around that with the 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 moon mining or any type of station you're able to put on subcap weaponry and capital weaponry, and even with subcap weaponry, some of these NPCs uh, ex ex um. Ex- escalation fleets they have really tanky resist to where they would be able to obviously be able to tank even your structure weaponry so i, I just i was thinking like with him uh, earlier like uh, how would that affect us and and in the future you know what would players be able to do to stop uh possibly incursions onto their own uh fields of moons hmm <laughs> While we're, while we're waiting for chat to respond, it's definitely something interesting that I'd be curious about, not just in a high sec sense, but also if you're thinking low sec or null sec, if these diamond rats start to, to munch on moon ore, I could steal some pretty valuable R64 resources, which I think would be hilarious. Sounds like uh, Nick is still muted. That's okay. Learning the lessons of matter all. In addition to all the, the hype around the no downtime thing, we have a look here at the EVE Online status monitor. So this is sort of the number of players who are online at any given time. I personally was curious to see if uh, EVE Online is a game where people have a tendency to AFK. I wondered if downtime not being there and booting them off would result in our player base being significantly elevated because they just their accounts were still there. Uh, as far as we can tell, it doesn't seem to occur, but it is nice to see where the spikes 
of everyone being kicked off the server did not occur. So that's pretty awesome. Nice to see. We also had CCP who did a DJ set at the volcano in Iceland, which was really awesome. They had just a chill stream going on with some awesome music, and they've since uploaded it to YouTube. So if you have some time, throw that up in the background where you're getting some work done. Any other final thoughts on no downtime before we move on to another topic? All right. In other CCP news, we had, um, I believe it was World Suicide Prevention Day on September 10th. So CCP put out a dev blog, You Are Not Alone, just going through some of the phenomenal resources this community has created throughout the years in order to assist with our players and their mental health needs. Um, so we had Broadcast for Reps, which was highlighted specifically, as well as, I believe, some other players and in in-game groups who are working to really just make sure that we're propping each other up and providing the support that everyone needs from time to time. Speaking of which, as long as we're on the uh, not so fantastic topics, but it's definitely stuff worth mentioning. We had Vile Rat Day, or there may be other names depending on where you're from, but it is the tribute and the anniversary of uh, the passing of Vile Rat. He was a very influential player back in the day of EVE Online, member of... What alliance was he a member of? Help my memory, please, if anyone does know. He was in Goon Swarm. I believe he was their diplomat, their head diplomat, or at least a very influential one. I'm sorry, my, my knowledge of history is not the best, but at the very least, um, everybody knew who he was. They knew that he was a fantastic person to work with, a fantastic person to talk to. And unfortunately, um, no longer in the game, but we still remember him and his impact on the game. So you can participate in everybody remembering that in various sign of vigils or threads on r slash eve, or just go check out the old video, which is interesting to watch. All righty. Other player news going on. What else do I have here? Looks like there was a big fight going down between Wrecking Coalition or Wrecking Crew, Wrecking excuse me, and uh, Fire Coalition. Does anybody have some details on this one? Or should I just go through the battle report? Battle report it is. It is um, happening down in the south west of EVE Online. So we were talking about Providence a little bit earlier. Wrecking Crew, specifically, that's sort of their, their base of operations. And they have extended down when the war was happening between Pappy and the Imperium. They took the opportunity to extend their power down towards the, the catch area, sort of old legacy space. Fire Coalition also are down operating in that area. And so that's sort of the area of conflict where we're discussing. And this fight took place over an XIX uh, Raitaru, which is an engineering complex. It was being used for staging in the Dread Bomb staging system. And so everybody formed up to try and kill it, and things just escalated and escalated and escalated. So definitely very interesting to see. Lots of dreads continuing to die. It's wonderful, in my personal opinion, to see a continuation of capital losses. We talked about the super caps dying earlier. Now we're seeing dread bombs happen, even after the industry changes with the, the massive spike in price of these dreadnoughts. People are still willing to field them in mass numbers and use them for their strategic objectives. I believe in this particular fight, a uh, wrecking crew did win. They succeeded in not only killing 234 billion isk worth of Fire Coalition ships, but also in destroying the staging Rataru and getting it out of their system. I forgot to mention, by the way, Fire Coalition had the backup of Fraternity and Test Alliance, please ignore. So that's worth noting that they came in there. And then the Army of Mangoes joined up with Dreadbomb for the other side of the engagement. All righty. Well, does anybody else have any final thoughts? Oh, I almost forgot. New player experience. I'm sorry. I should have mentioned this earlier when we were discussing CCP news, but we had some awesome visual updates to the new player experience. Looks like CCP is continuing to put lots of effort into this one. And here we've got just some images of the air station. I forget already. What does air stand for? 
I forgot to. Okay, okay. well, they need to work on their branding. Um, <laughs> Let's see. I'm pulling it up. I, I forgot to. <laughs> I guess if everyone knows them as air, it's sort of like tests. Okay, I guess you know their test alliance. Please ignore. I can't think of another good, another good yeah, analogy. PFAC pan. Uh, Intergalactic Association for Interdisciplinary Research. There you go. Oof, that's a mouthful. Yeah, they should stick with air, but I mean, for what they lack in branding, they make up for certainly in interior design because these stations look really freaking awesome. I'm super excited to see how this gets integrated into the new player experience. I would love for, for new players to spawn in this and then explore out into the rest of the galaxy. Will there be one of these in each faction, or is this going to be like in a specific location? So I think new players will be starting in like uh, an instance location, kind of not like fully instance, but like away from the main game um, for a little bit until they get brought back into the normal starting systems after they do like a an intro section, kind of. That's actually smart. Um, because if you do it that way, you don't have to worry about the crazy deployables. I know there was a whole issue a few weeks ago about how, um, you know, it was noted that a lot of new players get anxiety whenever they first undock because there's just cans and cans of advertisement. Well, if it's instance, they don't have to worry about that uh, harassment. At least know? for the first moments of the game. <laughs> then they get put right back there and they see it again. <laughs> Do I need to get back on my soapbox here? Like, come on, this is totally... Like, even in the air station, you've got advertisements all over the walls in here. I've got Jita in my background. You can see all the Jita advertisements. Why shouldn't the players be given the same opportunity? Because it... I have to give them a good overview to start with. Oh, That's okay. why. I don't know where to work Fair to. enough. We can improve the overview. I will accept that as some feedback. Also worth noting, uh, with the Alliance Tournament, the player ads, maybe we can get some of those. It was the Corporation Propaganda Contest, excuse me. So a, a select number of corporations will get their ads added to the video feed right back over there. it would be really cool. I, I'm still personally a fan of letting the can stay there. I, It just fits the vibe, you know? <laughs> okay. I'll die on my hill. It's fine. <laughs> All right, well, a very busy week in EVE. A lot of interesting things happening both on the CCP side of things with the no downtime, with the updates to the new player experience, as well as their constant efforts to promote uh, the EVE online community and make sure that all of you guys are taking care of yourselves out there, guys and gals, I should say. Um, and then also a lot of interesting stuff happening with the players. Tons of fights occurring all around the map. There's uh, plenty that we did not get the opportunity to talk to because we didn't have the necessary context to do so. But certainly you can feel free to head on over to Zkill or look at various tools which we've gone through in the past to see what's happening in and around an EVE Online. Any other final thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, I kind of wanted just to throw this out here. I, I really yeah. find it interesting that people aren't um, afraid to drop their capitals uh, like it was being speculated. Um, there was a lot of... Uh, people speculating that, you know, with these changes, people are going to be more afraid to drop their capitals and their dread, dread bombs and titans into random fights and, you know, not uh, they'll be worried about losing them. Um, at this moment in time, I don't believe that is, you know, I feel like people are just still going to do what they need to. They might have to change their plans up a little bit, but there's still a lot of people that are willing to drop those assets out there, and I think that's kind of cool. So, wherever those assets do the best job they're going to get used almost regardless of how much money they cost it makes me think of way back when titans first came out and they're like oh there's only gonna be one or two per server and like well, look how that turned out uh, per this for the whole server look how that turned out there's sometimes fights in in millisec among uh the biggest groups in the game that just feel tons of them um the cost does impact uh people um it might change how willing small groups might be to use them recklessly but for important objectives when they are the uh best choice to use people are going to use them um even if they cost a bit more i think i like, mean 
for small groups, I, I would argue it's even more important that you want to use the best tool for the job, because if you're a small group and you're not playing that N plus one game to the fullest, you've got to use every tool in your toolkit. You've no, got to except that if tools. you're if you're a small group fighting a big group, you don't have the 30 uh, uh, alts of, of dread standing by waiting for you to drop your five, right? <laughs> Fair enough. That's yeah. a good point. Um, I did also just want to briefly ask the question, do we think that people are more willing to drop these capitals because they know that changes are coming to mineral distribution or not necessarily mineral distribution, but the, the way that we gather resources in the game with the end of scarcity in Q4 or quadrant four, excuse me, do we think that that is allowing people to be more bullish because they know that give it a few months maybe, but they can, they can replace those assets. No, I don't. I don't think it's. I don't think it's that. E even if it, it was in two months, it would. It would still take a lot of. In this current time, like you know, it would still take a lot of work to get those same resources and rebuild them. I think it's just that people have learned to adapt in the certain times that they're in, and they've been able to plug what holes they need to to get what they need. And with the new phase that we're in, they're able to live around those changes and build what they need to. I kind of feel like it's that. Because even if you were to like, oh, go ahead. Yeah, that, that's all I was just gonna say. I just, I just think people are just they've they've adapted. The people that are willing, like Snuff or you know Baltrum's group, um, they've they've adapted it and they've um, you know they've they put whatever placements they need to put in to basically cover their their corporation or their specific alliance, and they're able to lose a certain amount too uh, of holes or you know ships um and i don't think they're planning on losing these ships and then waiting for two months to happen to rebuild those no i feel like they have the means and the capacity to do that already in the current climate that we're in yeah we've also got some points happening in in the twitch chat where people are asking are we going to go back to the same sort of resource abundance that we had pre-scarcity and that made scarcity a necessity in my opinion i would certainly hope not what, what are your guys's opinions <laughs> Our engineer is chomping at the bit to have some thoughts on this, but uh, unfortunately, we are all, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, we're we're spared from that. I know from I from my perspective. Question. Go ahead. No, sorry, I actually missed the question. My alarm had went off. What what, did, what was the question? Right I was about? So there was a question posed by Tib in our Twitch chat, which is: Is CCP going to be bringing back? The same level of resource abundance that we had in Oracles Online that made scarcity necessary. Oh, I personally been. hope not. What do you guys think? I think no, that's a future think. point. Sorry, go ahead. I mean, no, I'm in. I'm in agreement with you, RC. I don't. I don't believe they'll put that back in at that way. The same way, the old way. Excuse me. RC, you said it would defeat the point. What? Like, what point if surplus was a problem that they had to do scarcity for, why would you put conditions that would lead to it happening again? Um, I think that. Like the whole wealth surplus era was maybe uh, too lucrative, and they're now now that they pulled it back for a bit with the scarcity, they can start tuning it to be kind of in the middle, and not back to the old uh, surplus values. I think yeah. each space is going to have its advantages. Um... And specifically, NullSec. I think there was actually an update uh, last week where they uh, did they improve the Mercoxic belts, or was it another belt they added? I, I think they had improved the Mercoxic belt, where they made it largest. Now, is that correct? If anybody want to help me out with that, I remember seeing yeah. some stuff on Hobo Leaks where there were some anomalies renamed to the Mercoxic anomalies. I think that might be what we're referring to. Yeah, it was Hobo Leaks. Um, I th I believe, and I, I hope Nick's going to jump in or help me out with this, I believe they're adding them as largest now, which I don't believe they were before. And kind of what I'm just getting at is each space will have its advantages. No longer will you be able to be a NoSec and not be able to uh, be a NoSec and not have to go into other parts of space to get what you need. 
that's why you see fraternity moving closer to no low sec because they they understand that in this new phase of uh changes happening they have to have some footing in high sec they have to have some footing in low sec they have to have some footing in null sec so they can still be able to be viable because you can't just sit in your one pocket at 20 jumps away from low sec of space and you know get what you need no you have to well you can but it'll be expensive if you want to keep your costs down and still be able to reliably make what you need to, you have to get boots out there and bodies out there to get them yourself. Um, that's kind of what I, I, I feel like. Can I have some industrialist heresy on air for a moment, please? I am not happy that these groups are able to operate in all of those areas of space. I would love it if there were some sort of barrier there such that, I don't know what that barrier has to be, maybe just convenience but such that there had to be some subcontractors so that they had to purchase from other players the items which they needed instead of just being able to monopolize it and have the, the full chain. I realize the industrialists out there will be screaming at their monitors saying, no, why would you do that? You want to have the most efficient setup possible. But for me personally, I think that's a lot of great player interaction that opens up opportunities to create alliances, to create interesting politics, to have conflict occur. Um, that's that's well, what that, I would like to see, but that's that will eventually come though. That's that. So like, uh, l looking at fraternity, I believe their structures are open to everybody to do reactions and to put up sale orders. Uh, when you flip the coin, snuff didn't allow that. So you're obviously seeing more people go to fraternity. So I feel like eventually, if you you want to be able to be viable, you're going to be willing to open up your business to other players. And what's that? starts that'll create more wealth for other individuals who are smaller who are a little bit more flexible who are able to bring those resources into bulk to wherever you base from and then you'll start to see those alliances and monopolies built around that type of thing how would you artificially stop somebody from making every part in the chain like, yeah i, I don't because they know. even is a game where everybody has like five accounts <laughs> Well, complexity you, and time. You make some very I mean, good points, yeah. Well, just, just complexity and time. Like, are, are you, with your five accounts, going to be willing to go to Wormhole to mine those gases, or are you just going to pay somebody lower than buy price, uh, give that player quick money, and get your resources quick so you could just kick that back into production? I feel like most industrialists get, like, their stuff mined from, like, their alliance and buy it from that way. And I don't know, maybe I'm wrong about that. Yeah, I mean, I like you have to, themselves. if you're doing it effectively, you have to consider the opportunity cost, right? So if the, the value that you gain by mining the resources yourself is less than the value you would gain by spending that time on something else, just getting those skill points on something else, then you should consider just doing that something else and taking the ISK to purchase the, the materials from another group. So that's ideally what I would like to see is it's just not worth it. Well... Maybe, maybe not, because if it's not worth it for you, the null sec industrialist, to spend your time mining the low sec ore, then it's probably not worth it for the low sec miner to mine the low sec ore. So it's very much a complicated thing. I'm less speaking of specific mechanics and more of a, a general mindset that I would prefer to see it where smaller groups can carve out a niche and they can have their interconnectivity with the rest of the EVE economy in a meaningful way, rather than just you have to be a part of this big block in order to do it effectively or you're out of luck. Risking making this conversation like really long. I think that had already exist. Um, you know, Damn Phantom is a good example. Uh, at first we weren't even recognized by Fire Coalition, but because of our ability to mine and not only supply them with a lot of minerals that not, it's difficult for them to get, but they're just, uh, it's gonna sound kind of like rude, but they just not they're not willing to get. We were able to get our own blue standings at one point in Fire Coalition without actually having to join Rusher Khan, which was our original hosting alliance. And we were able to deploy our own structures as well. So I feel like a little bit of that does exist and it'll eventually exist. It's just gonna be based off of the group and what you're willing to bring to those alliances and corporations. You know what I mean? Yeah, fair enough. Uh, worth mentioning somebody in the chat to so stop with the opportunity costs. Otherwise, you need to do station trading because that's that's the best opportunity cost wise. I'd say to a certain extent, but the more station traders you have, like somebody has got to be losing the ships or mining the ore or whatever. So then the opportunity cost would rise for those for those things. And it would eventually balance out. 
There's also the fun factor. I personally, as much as I can appreciate station trading is probably worth a lot of ISK, I'm not going to spend my time on that. That's not what I enjoy doing. And so that's also another consideration that we have to bring into here is do you enjoy the mining gameplay? Do you enjoy the industry gameplay? Do you enjoy the station trading gameplay? For my I'm gameplay personally, to... I like I'm trying to learn industry, so I am forcing myself to spend time on it, even though I am losing ISK half of the time. So it it is very much a situation where you need to consider not only the opportunity cost, but also the the fun of the gameplay. So thank you for that question, bringing out that nuance. All right, any other final thoughts on this one without diving us into a three-hour discussion? Nope. Right on. Well, thank you guys for joining me. I'd like to thank Beltram. He's, he's gone off to do other esports-related items. Also, thank you to our panel today. Uh, we had Khan, as well as Arcia, and our engineer, Nick, whom the audience was spared from hearing his delightful commentary. <laughs> That'll do it for Talking in Stations. See you in a few days.